Welcome back, guys, back to Build Stuff 2020. We had a little pause, a little break, and now we're back with Milda, who is going to talk about a lot of interesting things and graphs and stuff like that and so on. So, Milda, you can wave into the camera and say hi to everyone. Hi, we cannot everyone. see the audience, but the audience can always see us. So, uh, once again, I'm here to remind you to keep it uh, alive in the chat. And if you have any questions during any moment uh, during the speech, please post them. We're going to answer them in the end of the session or just after the session. So, more about Milda. Milda started her career with Python, working in a couple of Vilnius based startups, but quickly moved to Scala and Node.js. Currently working in the Wix.com company that creates a leading website building platform. I'm sure you heard of it. Uh, she's interested in quality code, test-driven development, and coding as a form of self-expression, which is nice. At the end of the day, she loves to boulder climb and is the owner of the cutest dog in Vix.com office. I heard that we cannot see the dog right now, and dog is not right there with... with yeah. Me. yeah, the dog but... is self-quarantine, so... Yes, so... If somebody really, really wants to see the dog, maybe we can show a picture in, in screen share, but that's all we can do. <laughs> so uh, that's all from me, and I'm looking forward to you, Milda. Stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. So hi, everyone. This is very, very weird to talk into a void, uh, so I brought a very nice uh, audience members uh, to, to keep me company, uh, to make it feel more at home. Uh, I, I do get to wear pajama pants when doing this presentation, so there is a silver, 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 silver lining to this situation. But yeah, I'm very sad that we cannot see each other in person. So I am going to be talking about graphs. Uh, it's going to be a bit of the intro presentation, nothing too difficult, nothing too complex. So if you're an expert in graphs, I guess good for you but uh, this is going to be a more of an intro level presentation and we will see at the end more interesting things where we can apply, apply graphs and uh, graph theory so as i mentioned I'm, i am going to be talking about graphs and if you enter a word graph and that looks like this and this is looks bad and this is not the type of graph that i'm going to be talking about and neither is this uh, fortunately because i guess you're tired of graphs like this and the type of graph graph that I'm going to be talking about is uh, this type. This is just a structure to represent some objects and the relationships between objects. The circles that are uh, that represent the objects are called uh, nodes and the lines that represent the relationship between those uh, objects are called the edges. So for example, uh, this graph could represent uh, some European countries that share a border. So like France has bordered with Germany, that's why they have a line connected. And it could uh, represent some flight networks, so some uh, airports that have direct flights uh, to each other. Or this could represent a TV show's uh, friend characters who kissed each other on screen. And by the way, it's both of them. Uh, so a good thing about having this such structure that we can model uh, many things as is that there's a whole side of mathematics that analyzes and solves problems in such structures. So by uh, making our real life problems in these abstract um, structures, we can solve the problems using the abstract solutions that are already invented. And the first ever person to represent his uh, real life problem as a graph was the creator of graph theory himself, Leonard Euler. And Leonard Euler, Euler was a, is a very famous, famous mathematician. I'm sure you heard of him. He lived in the 18th century. And he did spend a lot of his time in Prussia, in the Königsberg, uh, which is the current Kaliningrad. Uh, but back in the day, it used to look like something more of this. And people back in the day didn't have much exciting things to do, so they went on walks. And they created this uh, game for the walks where uh, you have to cross every bridge in this little park and cross every bridge only once. And this was one of those unsolvable uh, riddles. And Euler also took, uh, took on this task, and uh, he probably was a bit uh, lazy and didn't like to go on walks that much, because he started thinking as a real mathematician. And he noticed a few things. So firstly, there are four lines, uh, four lands and uh, several bridges connecting the lands. So each land has a 
odd number of bridges connected to it. And he quickly realized that if you cross the land through one bridge, you can leave it through another. But if you cross it through the third bridge, you cannot leave anymore. So if you add a, a new bridge, uh, then you can quickly solve this riddle. And it's, uh, it's a very short walk, which I'm sure he appreciated. Um, so he represented this uh, problem as what we no now know as graph and the number of lands connected, number of bridges connected to each land is what we now know as a, as a degree. Oh, by the way, uh, I did say that the circles are call called nodes, but they are also call uh, called vertexes and I uh, use them interchangeably, but I usually prefer uh, nodes. I don't know why I left vertex in here, but it's okay. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 since then, the, the graph which you can cross, uh, which you can walk by crossing every edge only once is called the Euler path. And the theory is that uh, the graph has an Euler path, so you are able to cross it uh, with uh, every edge only once, only if uh, exactly two or none of the nodes has an odd degree. So if it would be exactly two, like in this case, you come to one side, then you leave to another, and if it's uh, none, you go in full circle. And uh, thus uh, Euler uh, solved this, uh, at least uh, created a theory which solved this uh, solved this riddle and ruined a very nice game for the people of Kaliningrad and may probably reduce their number of walks. Joking, of course, uh, he created the graph the theorem uh, for which we love him and respect him. <laughs> he created many more things, I'm sure you know. Uh, so when we talk about graphs, we are kind of used to seeing them like something that looks like this. So circles and lines connecting them, but this is actually just uh, one of the ways of representing them. And the main idea is how we how we are thinking about graphs. So if, if for example, we have such a graph, this is a directed graph, meaning uh, that there is a one-sided relationship between the nodes. When I say this, I always want to say this very mean joke that it's one-sided relationship, just like your love life. But it's a mean joke, and I'm not going to say that, but uh, I just always get this, uh, this joke in my head. Uh, so this could be uh, like people on Twitter who follow each other. So one people follows uh, another, and the one, another one doesn't follow the other back, or, or that follow, follow like in some cases. Uh, so this directed graph could be uh, represented as something that is called the adjacency matrix, uh, which is it's uh, once if the people uh, follow each other and zero if they don't follow. Uh, but of course, it takes a lot of uh, space and it's, it doesn't uh, hold the, so many things in it. So this uh, graph would be a weighted graph. So for example, this is uh, people who live in the same neighborhood and the distance between them. Uh, so they just have some value. Uh, this adjacency matrix could also hold this value. Or the previous um, graph could also be represented as an adjacent playlist. So a, a set of uh, nodes and the, they are connected to the graphs uh, to the nodes that uh, are their neighbors. And you can start to feel that it's something that is very easily represented as a, a computer program. Uh, so when talking about graphs, we must start talking about graph algorithms. And graph algorithm is basically any processing done with a graph. You can literally create an algorithm which goes through every node in the graph and uh, generates a dirty word for every node and call it your dirty word graph algorithm. I don't know why, why you would like to do that, but there are much more useful graph algorithms which solve a lot of problems. One of the most uh, most uh, used uh, group of uh, algorithms for the uh, shortest pathfinding uh, problem, which can be easily explained by a real life example. So this would be like a Google Maps and we want to get from one point to another. So from this uh, car to this little person, maybe it's a Uber car or something. And there are multiple ways how you can reach your destination. And how does Google know how to, how to reach the person the quickest? So uh, it's easy to see that this problem could be represented as a graph and it could be solved by using a graph algorithm called the Diaxtras algorithm. I sometimes mix up how it's pronounced because it's pronounced differently in different languages but diaxtras, I think, algorithm. And, the, and the, how this algorithm goes is uh, that you create a, a list of uh, nodes in the graph that hasn't been visited yet. You call it an unvisited uh, set. You create a table where you put the tentative distance to each of the nodes in the graph. 
uh, you set it to zero for your starting node, so for the B node here, and you start it to infinity for all of the other nodes. And then you iterate through every node. You calculate the distance to the neighbors of this node. So in this case, it's only one neighbor. So you, you compare this value to the value in the table. So 20 is a bit less than infinity, and you put it in the table if it's less. And you uh, you mark uh, from which node you came to this. Uh, you remove this node from the visited uh, set, and it will never be visited again. And and you move to another one uh, to another node to the node that has the lowest uh, tentative distance in the table and hasn't been visited yet. And you continue to do it uh, until you reach your uh, finish node, or until you went through all of the nodes that are possible to 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 go to. Uh, it depends on, uh, on what result you want. If you just want to go from uh, node A to node B, uh, it's enough to do that. Or you can create like a whole tree of the shortest paths from your starting point. And uh, I actually wanted to implement this maybe together with you, but I realized that it's not, it might take a longer while and it's not that interesting. I trust your abilities to implement this very simple algorithm, but I do want to show you one thing, so I will go through a, a very simple implementation that I did. It, uh, it's a function uh, which calculates the shortest path. Uh, it takes uh, as a parameter a, a graph that looks like this, so it's uh, every node and the, the object containing the neighbors of this node. Uh, so you create a, create a visited uh, set, you create a table of the tentative distance where you set it to zero if it's a start node and you set it to uh, infinity for every other node. Mm -hmm. You start from your start node and you iterate iterate uh, through the neighbors of your uh, node and calculate the distance to every neighbor. And if the distance is smaller than the distance currently in the table, you set it as a distance and you and you set where you came from, and um, you remove it from the invisited set, and you set the current uh, node as the node with the lowest tentative distance in the table. I added a couple of logs, so we can run um, test. Oh, we won't see anything here, but this is the same graph that uh, we had in our examples. So you, it goes from start to FG finish, and the distance is return. So if you see here, we went from start, the node B, to FG, and we finished in the distance 110. Uh, and what I want to show is that I created a little graph from these uh, 17 Lithuanian cities uh, all across Lithuania. And I want to find a path from Vilnius, uh, the town where I currently sit, uh, to all the way to Majeki, which is a Lithuanian town which was firstly chosen because it's far far enough that I can show it to you. And it is famous for its production of ice cream and oil products. So uh, we want to drive there to get some ice cream and some gas. Uh, and uh, actually our algorithm can provide us with the shortest distance. So if uh, I run it with this uh, graph, I can see in the result, uh, can see in the result uh, the table of uh, tentative distance. We went from we know how to get to each of these towns in the shortest possible path, and the distance from Vilnius to Majeki is 302 kilometers. And we go from Vilnius, Okmergep, and Shule, and Majeki. And actually, if we enter this to Google Maps, we get a very similar route. We go from Vilnius to Okmergep to Panevejis, which is my hometown. And also I heard it called the, uh, being called the Detroit of Lithuania. It's partially true, but not really, uh, to Shule, which has similar reputation. And you reach Majeki and buy some pretty, pretty ice cream. Uh, the, uh, I do must uh, mention that the Dioxers algorithm isn't, isn't the algorithm that Google uses, of course. Uh, I did read that they uh, might use the ASTAR algorithm, which is called uh, the extension of the Dioxers algorithm, or at least could be called, and, uh, and then, then it's used for more complex uh, scenarios. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised that 
like I, I would expect that they actually use some algorithm that they created themselves uh, as it's easy to create an algorithm as we know. Uh, this diextras algorithm isn't only relevant for like physical maps, uh, but also for receiving our internet, uh, because the diextras algorithm is one of the algorithms in the link state, pro link state protocol, which is a protocol, which is a part of the routing protocol, which is a part of the internet protocol. So this is how we receive our internet connection and how it works is that each of the routers in the network receive the information about uh, what uh, neighbors they have in the network and what neighbors do the neighbors have and they uh, they make uh, like a map of the all of the routers in the network independently they make this map in in the shape of a graph and independently independently calculate the most logical next step to where to uh, forward the packets so this is how our internet also reaches us uh, the fastest of course, there are much uh, more problems problems in the shortest path and uh, much more algorithms. And one of my favorite problems is the graph coloring pr problem, which is that you have to color your graph in such a way that the two nodes that are connected uh, are in different colors. And uh, by using the lowest possible number of, uh, of colors and uh, a lot of really nice uh, real life problems can be represented in, in such a way. For example, when I was a when I was a child, I used to think that the, every teacher looks like this at the beginning of the semester uh, because they have to schedule the classes and the classes cannot happen at the same time. Uh, but then I read when I got older that uh, this uh, usually represents as the graph coloring problem. If you mark the classes as the nodes and the classes are connected, if they have students that take the same class. Uh, you can schedule and you mark the colors as, as the time slots where the when the class can happen. You can schedule it in such a way that the two uh, two uh, classes which have the same students won't happen at the same time. And this is uh, also uh, also where graphs help. And uh, the same algorithm is used for like Sudoku solving. So you might uh, want to help your grandmother with the Sudoku uh, solving. But I read more interesting. Uh, uh, more interesting problems where this algorithm uh, helps. It was about this one uh, network company which had like 75,000 instances across the world and they wanted to update them uh, regularly and uh, they couldn't do it one by one of course because it would take forever and they couldn't shut down everything because some of the instances had to be up like one of, or, or the other uh, should be up to, uh, to still have the service uh, running. So if you mark the, your instances as uh, graph nodes and you they are connected, if they cannot be shut down at the same time as and the colors uh, as the time slots when the uh, like as the batches where you restart your infrastructure, uh, you are able to restart it very efficiently without uh, ever losing service. And I think they restarted it in like eight batches, uh, which is maybe maybe pretty nice. And Okay, there are more different ways on, on how to apply a graph theory, not only like creating, like seeing a problem, representing it as a graph and searching for a solution. Uh, it's also valuable for gaining more insights about uh, the system that you have represented as a graph. Uh, so for example, I have this uh, microservice architecture. We have some web API and some backend services and some external integration services. And the microservice architecture can be really easily represented as a as a graph. So the microservices are the the nodes, and they are connected if they call each other. So this, of course, could be a directed graph if we just want to see an exact relationship on who calls who, or uh, this could be a weighted graph if we want to see the RPMs of the services. But just in this case, for just for the sake of simplicity, I left it uh, as it is. So uh, and we can we can introduce a few uh, graph analysis algorithms uh, to find uh, some metrics. For example, as we already talked about the degree. So if, if in this case, like the service A has a much uh, higher degree than the services B and C, uh, which means that it's being called or calls much much more services. We can take um, into consideration a metrics called the cluster coefficients 
which calc which just means how tight is the group of nodes so how how coupled is the microservices in your architecture uh, we can explain this by imagining that this is a group of friends so a person on the right knows uh, three people uh, and from these three people the top person and the bottom person don't know each other so the cluster coefficient is 0 0.66 uh, because so it's a tight group of friends but they not all of them know each other so it's like a probability uh, uh, if uh, any person of the group will know the other person. And there is a group on, on the left, and the person on the left also knows three people, but all of these uh, three people also know each other. So the cluster coefficient of this uh, of this group of friends is uh, 1.0, so it's a very, very tight group of friends, very, very coupled microservices, and all of them call each other. And we can uh, use this information to help us identify which services are more of, like the most coupled into our architecture and use this information for many reasons. For example, we want to improve our resilience so we can do like some, some chaos monkey style of testing to our infrastructure. If we shut down like one of the most important services, what will happen to our system? Do all of the other services can recover? Uh, do, if, if they can, maintain as much service and as we would expect without having like shipping uh, up and uh, and then then we can take another metric called the community detection which helps to identify the communities inside our architecture so which clusters of uh, microservices are the most coupled to each other which can help us in a few ways so uh, for example uh, Maybe maybe it can help us to detect that we have more like less uh, microservice architecture or and more of something like a distributed monolith, which we all know is not the situation where we want to be. So maybe our architects expected that the user uh, service and the pricing service will be decoupled, but they actually are very coupled together. And this is like a just uh, something that helps us notice that easier. And also maybe this information could be used for our deployments. Uh, we want the, all of the microservices that are in the same communities to be deployed on the same physical data centers, whereas we don't care that much that the services uh, from other communities would be there as well. Uh, I am just throwing uh, a bit of ideas here. So if you are interested more in this topic, uh, if you are interested more in this topic, uh, I can share some resources where uh, from the people who actually do it and where I found this information, and maybe they are they are a bit more detailed about this. But I have found it pretty interesting. Also, a very similar analysis can be uh, introduced to our uh, to our code. We can analyze our object-oriented code specifically because it's very easy to reproduce as a graph. So the classes are the nodes, and they are connected if they call each other. And I marked one algorithm, which I found pretty interesting in identifying the, like the God classes. So the classes that are very busy, they are called by many and they call a lot of people. And I extracted this algorithm because I found it pretty interesting as this is the same algorithm that is actually used for a web page ra uh, ranking. So a web page has a score, which is combined from two uh, for, from two separate scores, so it's a, it has a good hub value if it uh, contains a lot of links to another high ranked uh, pages, and it has a good authority value if it's being uh, uh, linked to by a lot of high ranked uh, hubs. And uh, the combination of those two scores uh, define the rank of the of the web page. Uh, so. Also, um, if we have a legacy system from uh, from 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 uh, of object-oriented code, we could as a graph and detect what pattern was tried to be used in this uh, in this uh, code uh, by by comparing the graph of our code to the graph of the system that actually would be what would the expected graph of the of that uh, of that design. Uh, design pattern by using some graph matching algorithms and uh, and then, then see which design pattern was there. I am not sure if it's if it is a very practically applicable and very useful um, thing that we can do with graphs in our code. Maybe there are, I think, more simple ways to do it. 
just go into a code and look for a factory. Uh, but I do find it uh, pretty interesting. Maybe it can spark some ideas. Uh, so when talking uh, about graphs, uh, it's pretty necessary to mention social networks, as social, net social networks can be very easily represented as graphs. So a person, uh, the graph of Facebook friends would be a person, a person, they are friends, so they are connected, like the Twitter graph would be directed, as I mentioned before, the Instagram as well. And uh, I think uh, many of you heard the idea of the six degrees of separation. So it's the idea that every person in the world is uh, connected to another person in less than six humans. So you could say a friend of a friend about basically any person in the world in just uh, uh, six steps. And for the 90s kids, this might be known as the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. It was this very, very popular game and the uh, idea and uh, uh, it created it like had this web websites where you could check it and everything so that every uh, actor in Hollywood could be traced back to Kevin Bacon in less than six movies that they appeared together with. Uh, I recently watched the movie Scream and they even mentioned it there. So I was like, huh, this, I must put it in my presentation. Uh, but we, let's get back to, 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 to six, uh, degrees of separation, the original idea. So we actually could prove it if we would have like this huge graph of all the people in the world and they would be connected to the people that they know. And we could do it by calculating the diameter of the graph. This is a metric of um, the metric of the distance, like the number of nodes between two uh, nodes that are the furthest apart. And uh, of course we don't have such a um, such a metric, but actually, phase, but we do have like huge graphs of uh, of uh, social networks on social networks of like graphs of people who know each other on social networks. And a few years ago, Facebook did calculate it and did did find that the six degrees of separation are actually four degrees of separation. And at least on the internet, people know each other in less than uh, four four steps. So you are four steps away from. Trump. Does Trump have Facebook? Maybe. At least in Twitter. It's probably similar in Twitter as well. Well, hmm. well hmm. okay. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, well, searching for this information, this is very, very, very off, off topic, but I just found this paper which I found fascinating. So, I just wanted to share like a very completely different application of graph. Graph theory more uh, on network science, which is uh, basically graph theory, just working with uh, much bigger, much bigger graphs. Uh, so this, uh, maybe you might know that there is this theory, uh, like this debate, whether most, like biblical Moses was a true person or, um, or just like metaphorical person to portray some ideas. And the scientists of which did this paper uh, compared like the social network on Moses. So his contacts with other people in the old, uh, like testament books to the social networks of humans that are like actually known to be real pe real people and they compare he like he compared the the this graph like probably by using some graph matching algorithms or something uh, to to determine whether it's possible to have such a social network that uh, biblical voices had or it's not possible and uh, I, I read the abstract and the results and the results were inconclusive actually so so it's not a it's not uh, st still not clear, uh, and uh, I am so to wrap up. And so just to wrap up, uh, the graphs help us with a uh, with a uh, with many things. So firstly, it really helps us to understand uh, more about the things that we're already dealing with. As the graph theory, it's so much around us. I actually expected to be talking a bit longer, so I didn't put in so many things which we deal with uh, every day. For example, uh, our dependency installation. So if we if we start a service, it has to install its dependencies, and these dependencies depend on other dependencies. So the whole dependency tree, and in which order do we install the dependencies? So we have a working uh, working services is also a question of um, of uh, graph theory and uh, and any search that we do, and uh, and then then any. Uh, 
like version control is also deals a lot with uh, graphs. So if we understand just this abstract idea of graphs, we can understand really a lot about the things that we deal every day with. Also, we, we can find a lot of solutions when uh, when dealing with graphs. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, finding shortest paths, uh, finding like scheduling things and uh, and then, then the much more there are much more uh, much more groups of uh, algorithms which you should look into if you're dealing with something that can be represented as a graph and also uh, we can gain more insights about our system by uh, by like getting metrics about it uh, by analyzing it as uh, by using some graph analysis algorithms so our microservices and uh, and then much more. And just to prove that graphs are indeed everywhere, this presentation was also a graph. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Milda, very much. You were faster than you promised to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm very uh, scared that I skipped something. Like maybe there were more slides. I don't know. So I have one extremely important question to you, uh, to answer before you go. Can you show us the picture of the cutest dog in the Wix.com office? Oh no, this is my war computer. Are you... Do you I... have the photo? Because this is like this is something you know. You can you can't just go uh, go on just by saying I have the cutest dog in the world. No, yes. no, 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 no. We we have to see such things. It was supposed to be with me, but uh, I am now scared to go into my pictures if I'm still sharing my screen. I'm not sure because like... Yes, I you cannot. are still sharing your screen. So yeah. I cannot open my picture folder but because maybe there's something I shouldn't show. I but. know, but uh, <laughs> for for all I know, we cannot see your we cannot see your share screen right now and you can turn it off in Skype too, so I wouldn't see it too. Uh, by the way, Bidas has a, has a question if you want to answer. Okay. Okay. But, uh, so why this is asking, can you mention specific uses in software development tools of graphs, I assume? Specific use cases? Uh, of... Specific okay. uses in software development tools. So, so in software development tools, uh, well, firstly, I, I guess just in software development in general, so firstly, anything that can be represented as a graph problem and solved as a graph can be implemented in code and uh, solved by using it uh, when being a software software developer. Um, uh, or is he asking for a tools that could help us? Uh, he's saying he's uh, editing the comment and saying EDIs and such. Hmm. IDs, IDs. IDs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like my I's and E's are completely like, you know, in Lithuanian, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, I don't remember any, like I, I saw some, I saw some libraries that are like help you to represent your, your node code as a graph, just to see like a UI of your code as a graph. Uh, I didn't really search for it, so I cannot answer and give any specific names, but I do suggest to look it up and uh, give me the answer. We can still Google it all together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's more of um, like I really... So, anyway, about the dog. Yes. The, the, the audience cannot see your screen right now. You can go and, and search in your photos, but we need to see your dog. Okay. And we'll tell our tech guys when we want to see your screen. Okay. Don't show it yet. We need to find the Q.com office. And for all I know, Wix.com is, is huge. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So uh, uh -huh. if it's the cutest dog in the office, well, that's a lot. We now need to... I need to find the cutest picture of her. She's a girl. She's a girl. Okay, she's a girl. Oh my God, I'm seeing all the pictures, you guys. You guys. Oh my God, I see one. I see this. One. Yes, this one. This is the best picture. Okay, can we get can can we get the, back the screen share? Yeah. Let's see it. Yes. Look at that nose. She has a little pig nose. <laughs> yeah, just something like that. And she apparently ate something before. Like it might be food, it yeah. might be dirt. It always happens. 
<laughs> so this, but this is the cutest dog officially in the VIX.com office. The more you know every day. Yes, you came yes. to learn about graphs and you learned about the cutest dog. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Anything else, guys? Anything else, guys, you want to ask? Any, any questions? We have a few minutes left. And uh, so you can use Milda's wisdom. To, to, to answer some questions. Uh, or, or it can oh be my just more pictures. Yeah. Okay, people are finally re reacting. We have that normal delay, you know, like <laughs> how computers work. So I can now only see the people's reactions with all the heart eyes and everything. <laughs> we have more of dog, dog photos, but I'm not sure if we are going to show them. Showing? Okay, we're showing. Not holding for some reason. That, that guy just told me in my ear that we are showing more pictures, so we good. It's always good to see a nice dog. Yes, here. And this is why the mouth is also also watery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's the name of the dog? Trude. Trude, that's a Lithuanian name. Well, Lithuanian no, dog Tru name. Trudy, like Trudy is an international. It's a short, short for Gertruda, and the name of oh. my sister, my the name of my sister is name is Gerda, which is the short also for the same name. So I always found it very funny that I named my dog after my sister. Just so you decided to merge your sister and your and your uh, dog <laughs> for well, some reason. No, I say that only when I want to be mean with her, like just. Yeah, but actually, it's, it's it's a different story. Why? Yeah. There was actually like a plush toys uh, company that called Trudy, and all of the like toys are called Trudy, and she looks like a toy. So she definitely does. And talking about your sense of humor, it seems like uh, you're such a shy, awkward like girl. Like you know, lots of silence. And it and it's not like that because it, it, your jokes during the talk you gave. <laughs> well. Yeah. I mean, just like your love life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a joke, but, which I really wanted to tell, but then I thought it's very mean. And yeah, then... but you, but you told it, and you, and you told it in a form like I don't want to say this exact <laughs> phrase that I'm that I just said. So now I just said it, but it doesn't count. Yeah, it's very manipulative. I shouldn't do it with people. <laughs> So yeah, so let's say goodbye. Let's wave and thank you once again, Milda, for your presentation. That was informative and not like intro level because that was a little bit more than that. And uh, I see in the comments that people really found your presentation interesting. So we're happy about that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you nice and bye time. everyone. See you in the next session. Bye.